Hey, dude, this dog like stinks, man. Okay, groomer, do something about it, man. you pet stylists you found the groom pod welcome to our virtual salon my name is Susie, and i'm your host i'm a mobile groomer from seattle washington and anyone who knows me will tell you i love to talk especially about my job one of my favorite people to talk to is my friend and mentor and co-star of the show miss barbara bird Hey, Susie, I'm so excited to share with you my latest science journey. I've been getting deep with you. Excellent. I'm excited to learn all about what you've learned because you always break it down so well and make it mostly understandable. And at least if I hear it a few times, some of it seems to adhere to my brain cells, and I'm so appreciative of that. Hey, welcome to episode 423 of the Groom Pod, recorded on August 25th, August 25th. I can't believe how quickly the summer has gone by. We had to start a fire yesterday. It was so cold. Oh, that's a shame. It's very sad. Anyway, recorded on August 25th, 2024 in Snohomish, Washington and Simpsonville, South Carolina. This podcast is brought to you by our sponsors, Best Shot, Show Season, Precision Sharp, Groomore, and Stazco. And if you guys want to support us, you can do so by going to the website, thegroompod.com and clicking on the Help Barbara Here button or joining us on Patreon with that button. This week on The Groom Pod, we're going to talk about some things we want to try that we haven't tried yet. And maybe we've got connections out there and people will send us stuff. You never know. But we're going to try to do some more product reviews. And these are things we'd like to review. And then Barbara's going to really teach us some interesting stuff about allergy thresholds. And are they the missing link? And this week's What's New is brought to you by Groomore Software. If you haven't found Groomore, you're missing out. Groomore is an all-in-one software solution for your grooming business. Whether you are a solo mobile groomer or manage several shops, Groomore has everything you need. 24-hour online booking and forms, routing, credit card processing, reminders, Google Calendar and QuickBooks integration, and so much more. And the best customer service anywhere. Shop mobile or house call, Groomore has you covered. And they're giving us a free month. Just enter GroomPod22 in the coupon code. You're finally doing some grooming, aren't you? Well, yeah, one a week so far. <laughs> well, it, it's something. <laughs> I groomed another dog this week. Oh, yay. Yay. <laughs> I groomed a little Shih Tzu. And I left hair on it. I groomed it kind of with a, I started with a zero comb and then I went down to a peach comb. She wanted half off. You know, isn't that a difficult thing? Half off. I want to know how much to leave because we don't like half off. We don't like an inch off. That's like you would do to the bottom of my hair, take off an inch. It's like, how long do you want it when it's done? So anyway, did her with a peach comb. She came out real cute. And I, again, demonstrated to my new mom how to fluff dry and how to straighten coat. It's really hard to believe, but true, that she went to two schools and was never trained how to straighten coat and fluff dry. Never trained. That's just wrong. There's a lot of things that are wrong in groomer education. It's very inconsistent, one school to another. There's no fundamentals of teaching that are taught to people who teach. So teachers don't teach well. It's true. There's a formula to how to do a good job teaching, and some people have it and some people just don't. Now, like teaching is, is a whole segment of education at the college. You can go and become a teacher. You, you study how to teach. And uh, there should be a seminar, okay? There should be a seminar. But one of the things that people overlook 
is how individual learning is. Right. One individual doesn't necessarily learn best the same way another one learns best. I learn well by the written word and pictures. I'm not very good at reading. What reading and then gleaning the knowledge that way, I don't do as well as someone telling it to me. And I like what I call over the shoulder teaching. <laughs> I love that term. Over the shoulder, like um, actually assist people in a, getting to the vision of the end by giving them little tips as they groom. I wish I had been taught that way. You know, I was just taught where, where my teacher just blew in at the last moment of the day and went over my work and said, not this, not this, not this, and just fixed it all up, but very little explanation. And I just had to fail and fail and fail until finally I succeeded in passing, you know. And from the time I passed, then I was on my own to get better. And that happens a lot. There's no um, knowledge about individual learning styles and learning rates and the importance of repetition, clear repetition. And that doesn't really mean just a group of people down in front of a bunch of videos and expect them to learn, which is one of the things that uh, happened to Lynn. And she just didn't learn that way because she needed some explanation and some idea of why the groomer was doing that, whatever it was, you know, why we pick up these shears instead of those shears. So I'm learning a lot about learning <laughs> and I'm learning more about teaching, although I think that I'm a pretty good teacher. I think you're a pretty good teacher as well. I've taught grooming and I've taught percussion, drumming to women mostly, and some men. And so I think I know a little bit about how to trigger learning. And it's not by making people bad and wrong. It's not by ignoring mistakes and patting them on the back when they don't deserve it. It's so much more nuanced than that. And I, I wish we had more nuanced teachers in our industry. So that's another seminar. <laughs> I'm lucky because I got taught by someone who had just graduated from the Nash Academy when John and Vivian were doing it. And she came with her entire curriculum and literally taught me their curriculum out of her notes. And she was a spectacular keeper of notes. And she was so artistic. So I got one-on-one -on -one taken through the way they had it set up to learn. So I was really lucky. I had to hand scissor a poodle before I was ever allowed to graduate. And, and so I had to learn how to straighten that coat. And I had to learn how to scissor that coat. I'm not doing it on a daily basis today, but I'm certainly glad I have the knowledge that I learned from that. I've taught gymnastics and dance and sailing throughout all of my lifetime. I've been a teacher of all kinds of neat stuff and I really appreciate a good teacher. And like I said, you are a good teacher. Thank you. Yes. Because once in a while, I wonder. <laughs> <laughs> Don't we all? <laughs> but teaching and learning, it's a two-way exchange. Yes. If someone doesn't try to grab on to what you're saying, and if someone doesn't say, could you run that by me again? Yeah. A key to being a, a good grooming student is don't let things go swoosh. Go back and say, show me what you're doing again. Don't be ashamed that you don't pick up on things the first time you're shown them um, and don't like hide a lack of learning, <laughs> hide a lack of learning. People, there are people that start doing that in the third grade. Right. They hide a lack of learning all their lives and then just say, oh, if only I had tried to do this years ago. Well, no, years ago you were hiding a lack of learning. You got to love to learn. Yeah. 
See, I love to learn, and that means I got to change. That's right. That's what I was doing, pondering, teaching the teacher, learning to teach, learning to learn, and all of that. That could be an essay. Yeah, it certainly could. That could be a seminar, but never mind. <laughs> <laughs> So congratulations, Barbara, on being nominated for a podcast again. Yeah, and I wish they'd put our names on that. They do on other entries, but they don't want to have too much text on their poster. Well, I wish they would do the name correctly. I don't even bother to try to correct them anymore. They put it as two words every time, even though I've asked them so nicely over and over again. To, to put it as one word as it is, because it doesn't help people find us if they don't put the word correctly. That drives me crazy. It's so simple to check that. I also wish that they had links so that you could go watch these videos, these YouTube, the TikToks. I wish they had links to these people especially products and podcasts, video casts. I, I am stuck with some of these. I don't know the people. Yeah, it would be great and so easy to do. Then you'd have a little bit more educated voters. Yes. I was pretty excited about one thing. What? There are only podcasts in the category this year. Ah, no vlogs. Nothing, no vlogs, no blogs, no logs, no, <laughs> none of that. And for the first time, Chrissy Newmeyer smith was nominated for Creating Great Grooming Dogs. So I'm pretty happy about that. I'm, I'm happy to see that. That's a rough category this year. Oh, I'm excited that it's rough, though. It only took nine years for to get some competition out there, some individuality. And one person on one of the other Facebook groups asked when I posted the link to the podcast, what do people talk about on a grooming podcast? And I was just pleased as punch to be able to say, each one of the grooming podcasts has a different flavor, a different personality, a different focus. And we now have enough of them out there that are putting out content regularly that you can find something that will pique your interest. And it's so cool. And I'm glad that our friends traveling groomers and creating great grooming dogs are up there. And then Austin's new podcast, which is a panel podcast where they get like four or five people up. That one is also on there. I, I suspect they will be the winner, but uh, it's very cool. I'm just so happy it's grown. And if they would just dump the other stuff that's on that category, it would be very nice, but it happened anyway. Other stuff. Yeah. All that other stuff. Yeah. So this was a rough week for me. I lost people and pets. I lost the sandwich lady who made my sandwiches. Ugh, lives across the street oh. from my house. So that was a rough one. We lost Buddy the Bichon. It's amazing that he and his half a lung lived as long as he did. You know, he's 15 years old with horrible anxiety from the day he was born. And half a lung left on one side. And... um pretty amazing that he made it as long as he did and I knew I knew when I saw him last time so I was able wow. to say goodbye just because I knew in my heart he was telling me that he didn't want to fight anymore so that was hard yeah I know you know when you're kind of letting go I feel like that <laughs> same with the sandwich lady when I went in there and I just knew she had stopped eating when her husband died she didn't want to eat anymore and she she didn't make you a sandwich. Yeah, she did. <laughs> she did. She still made my sandwich, but she didn't want to eat anymore. My mother got like that. Yeah. I could just get her to eat key lime pie. <laughs> we were feeding her Chex Mix there at the end, and she was eating homemade Chex Mix, but then she even stopped that after Bill died. But, you know, well into their 90s, wonderful great people, the person who's known me the longest other than my brother. Oh, that was sad. Yeah. Yeah. And, and then on top of it, my husband decided to paint the house. He's going to paint <laughs> one side of the house <laughs> with a sprayer, right? <laughs> and of course, I'm like, okay, great. I'll see you when I get home. When I get home, 
he's all ready to paint the house with me helping. So I worked a 10-hour day, and then I came home, and I worked five more hours helping him paint the freaking house. <laughs> Looks good, though. I mean, it was very nice. The good wife. The good wife. I had to do it. I had to. I had no choice. So anyway, I'd far rather be grooming dogs. <laughs> hey, let's take a quick break, and then we're going to talk about some cool stuff that we wish we could try. Did you know that Stasco has come out with a couple of new products? First, there's the Stasco Oatmeal Protein Conditioner. This conditioner provides exceptional body and manageability and super shiny finishes. And it has a wonderful apple scent that I love. Great in the recirculator, too. And they have a new matching protein conditioning spray, dematting, anti-static conditioning, and finishing all in one, just like the original Stasco spray, but with that delicious apple fragrance. Look for these new products at trade shows and your favorite distributors like Cascade Grooming Supplies. Ready, groomers? Here comes our first appointment. Before we head off into our first appointment, I wanted to remember to thank Cascade Grooming Supply for the combs that we got engraved by Groomers Gone Wild website, who did it for us for free. And also on Groomers Gone Wild website, they have the silicone bands that you can mark the bottles of your shampoo with that are really cool. You just tell them what you want on it. They come in a bunch of colors. And Wesley will take care of you also if you're in the greater Seattle area and you need your dryer fixed. He's the guy to do that. So Groomers Gone Wild is where you can find that. Cascade Grooming Supplies is where you can find Michael. And thanks to both of you guys for the cool party favors that we had for Barbara's Nifty Party. So, the thing that spurned my interest in this whole things we want to try was, of course, what we were talking about last week where we decided we should do some more product reviews. But it's really the Coat Tender from Jody Murphy. If you ask anybody out there right now the thing they most want to try, I think it's the Coat Tender. Do you want to try the Coat Tender? Sure. I would love to try the Coat Tender. We were talking about learning earlier, and when I was learning from the instructor that I worked with, Lynn, she taught me how to card coats using a classic stripping knife. But with my arthritic hands, it has become very difficult for me to hold a stripping knife and pull it through the coat like I used to do. This coat tender solves that whole problem because she kind of takes what looks like the blade of the classic stripping knife and attaches an ergonomic handle to it and there's different sizes and it just looks like it's so much easier to manage and to handle and it does the basically the thing that just what carding with the spit it out Susie and it's just like carding with the classic stripping knife <laughs> do you like to card with a classic stripping knife do you have classic stripping knives I do they have a wider blade so you can put your thumb on it and it works well. I had it for Cocker Spanish Sporting Dog stripping. Yeah. And then I learned that it was a good carding tool for others. But I minimized my use of blades on coats. I mean, I, I remember in the very beginning, I used to even take a blade, a 40 blade or a 30 blade, an old one, and use it as a carding tool. But that was really hard on the hands. So the ergonomic handle thing uh, is enticing to me. And I'd love to try it. And I would love to determine if it's coat friendly. Yeah, that's what I was wondering. There's two sides to carding. There's what you pull out and there's what you do to the primary coat while you're pulling out the undergrowth um, around it. So like the Ferminator, Best Shot has shown that the Ferminator can actually tear a big swath down the cuticle of a, of a hair shaft lengthwise, just real long tears in primary coat. That's not necessarily going to happen all the time. That's the limitation of the SEM photographs is that it is like one little segment of hair on a whole coat. So you don't really know how often that happens in a given coat. 
or on different dogs or whatever. So there's a lot more science to be done in the whole area of coat damage and tools. Anything that is easier on our hands is worth trying. Absolutely. And for me who can't strip, it's kind of my cheater way to strip is using a stripping knife and that Furminator talking about using a 40 blade I think the Furminator was a kind of handle for a 40 blade it seemed like yeah it was 40 blade on a handle as was the loud knockoff that got him in legal trouble one of the tools that I use for carding um, a lot is the Chris Christensen cat tool like that comb yeah the little comb I get a lot of undercoat out of um, corgis, even short-coated dogs like chihuahuas. A lot of the hip (laughs) is this undercoat that you don't even know is there until you start carding it. And then, whoa, man, look what I'm getting out, you know? So I, I like that. And by the way, I've found an AliExpress knockoff of that comb. That's what I bought, and I love it. It's great. Yeah, I got a bigger one, but they have the little one, too. Oh, I got I found one for Lynn because she's a cat groomer, and she wanted something like that. I love to shop in China. I don't know. It's just fascinating. <laughs> well, speaking of shopping in China, I was shopping in China this morning because I got carried away thinking about the brush dryer discussion we were having and how you mentioned that the air comes from around the brush head. And I was like, oh yeah, I remember us talking about that. My brush dryer head won't stay on anymore. It just comes right off when I'm trying to brush the dogs, it pulls right off. So I've kind of lost my affection for that dryer. Mostly I'm using it without the head as just like a little stick dryer. And then I started to think, that I had seen other stick dryers that might have a little more power than that. So I kind of took a left turn and went on to AliExpress and I didn't find a stick dryer that I was overly happy with because they wanted too much money for them. But what I did find on Amazon as I was exploring around is a handheld gun-like dryer because my Andis handheld dryer is heating up the plug now. So that's an indicator that I need to replace it. I'm just going to go ahead and release that into the wild and let it go to wherever old hair dryers go. (laughs) And I bought this little, you know, the Dyson that looks like it's about the size of your hand and it's just got a little round end and a magnetic clip. Well, I bought a knockoff of that. And I know it's not going to be a Dyson because I didn't pay $300 for it or whatever crazy money they want for that. But I got it on sale for $48 yeah. through Amazon. So I'm really excited. It's called the Seven Magic High Speed Dryer. And it's got low noise. It's extra low noise because it's got a different kind of a fan generator. But it's extra high volume of air, it says. Now, we'll see what happens. It's a 1,400 watt dryer. It has three heats and two airflow speeds. So I think it's going to be cool. And I'm excited to get it. And I really need to go from two dryers to one dryer as far as carrying it around with me. And I'm not going to buy the Duz dryer because the base is a little bit big to fit in any of my cabinets. So I'm kind of stuck trying to find an alternative to that. So I'm excited about that. And I did start out on AliExpress, but I couldn't tell which ones I liked there besides this one comes in purple and it was actually a little cheaper. So woohoo! <laughs> it's all for purple. <laughs> well, when you get it, evaluate it and post us a link. I'll do it. If you like it. I'll do it. Okay. Next up on the list or on my list that I'm sure would have been on your list if you had a list are the wide blades. I would be happy to try the wide blades, but it's too much of an of investment for me when mostly I'm grooming rather small dogs. Well, I guess that it's going to fall on me then. I will have to try the wide uh. blades. What I know is that most of the clippers that we have are not built to drive that big a cutter. So I imagine that either the blades are going to heat up or it's going to where your blade drives out. But I'm strictly guessing on that because I don't have a new set of clippers that is kind of adapted to these new bigger blades. But I'm excited to try and I have never tried and I don't know which 
company to buy from. I think Precision Sharp might have some wide blades, so I might try to get them from Randy and Cheryl. Or I'll see what Michael has at Cascade Grooming Supply, see if there's a wide blade there. But what I want to know from our listeners is, what is it about the wide blades that you love so much? Just post it up on the GroomPod discussion group so I can figure it out. Because I haven't bought them because I couldn't figure out doing mostly small dogs as well where it would be useful for me. And secondly, how does it work with the clipper vac and the hand V taxi vac with the big mouth? Does it work okay? Yeah. Yeah, I was wondering about that. Okay, next. Best Shot has a new cologne coming out. Have you seen that? Best Shot has a what coming out? A new cologne and sentiment shampoo. Sugar cookie. Oh, yes, I got some. You got some? I, yeah, you sent me some. <laughs> you know, but I, I have an ambivalency here. Oh. Because Sugar Cookie is a name that show season has had for years and it's one of their best selling fragrances i i'm a little bit dismayed that best shot would take the name yeah that's interesting i didn't even think of that i didn't think of the proprietary nature of show season having had that cologne for so long it's one of their main sellers of cologne because it's really a great fragrance. I love the Best Shot Sugar Cookie, but I wish they had altered the name somehow. Yes, I agree. I wish they'd have chosen a different name, like just Cookie Cologne. Leave the sugar off. Just do something just slightly enough different so that you know it's kind of a similar smell, but it's not the same smell. Yeah, I agree. It's awkward for me because those are two of my favorite companies and they're two of our major sponsors. Yep. <laughs> so, okay, well, so moving like on. The one that, that something that makes you critical. <laughs> right, and we don't want to have to pit one against the other. Yeah, it's a dilemma. You don't want to pit one against the other. I would like to try one of the hose dryer holders, but the one that I picked up was awkward and I'm not sure it's for me. You know, it, it may be that they're all awkward, but I would like to try one of the other dryer holder. I just think it puts the wrong stress in the wrong spot on my wrist. And I don't know if they all are that way or if it was specific to the one. So that's another thing I'd like to try. Here's one that I know most people have tried, but I never have, and I've always been curious about, air muzzle. Oh, I've tried those. What's your opinion? It was nice to have one around. Sort of like, um, what do you call those poles that have the the grooming loop on the... Catch pole. A catch pole. Yeah. Well, I don't want to groom. I don't want to put dogs in crates without one of those. I'll get a dog out of a crate if it suddenly decides it ain't coming out without biting your hands off. So, you know, like I just always would have one of those. That was something that I used once or twice a year. Just was like really glad to have it once or twice a year. Well, the air muzzle was kind of like that. It does keep a cat from being able to bite you. Um, and it's pretty easy to just like smush it on its face, but it's not something that you want to use weekly. Or I didn't want to use it weekly. I just used it when I had a really difficult thing. And then I have to think, I don't do cats that I should need an air muzzle for in the grooming trailer. I mean, one, of, one of the most stressful days was when I had a cat that went mean. I like that term. It went mean on me. <laughs> and jumped off the table and went running around the shop hiding in different places and hissing and spitting and snarling at us as we tried to throw a towel over it to catch it again. And it took us half an hour to catch the damn fiercely reactive cat. Yeah. And I just don't groom cats that are that reactive. I had to go lock the front door because I had this vision of it frightened mean cat running out my front door as somebody came in. Phew. 
One other thing, two other things, two other things. I haven't tried the groomer's wall because I don't think it'll fit on my table, but I kind of want to try a groomer's wall someday. I think that's pretty cool. My table divider from Hanvey is not the most sturdy. It's flexible. I like that it's flexible, but it has a tendency to rip at the connection points. Mine just had a tendency to kind of curl and it, it didn't space like a straight barrier, kind of curled on the bottom and stuff. Uh, I loved having that. And I used to just keep it fastened to one pole and then kind of thrown off the table so I could just grab it and put it up there whenever I needed to reduce this. But now here I'm grooming on a smaller table and um, I kind of like that. I do. I have a 36 inch table and I swear by it. And I leave the table divider up. So I'm only half of the width of my table all the time. I just take it off when I have to have a big dog. So my table divider is up yeah. all the time. That's cool. I've got some to add. I want to try all the products from mainly long hair horse products. People. The ones we talked about last time. Like their products, and I want to try their brush and detangler comb. And they have a system where you you mix the polisher, which is the highly siliconized product, in with their conditioner to make a mix that is a detangler. I want to try that. And I also want to try OPA's treatment for coat problems that happen from coloring, by the way. Oh, neat. And that's a two product A plus B kind of thing. I would love to try those because I've seen the ingredients on those products and they are uh, like cutting edge in ingredient panels. I, I really would love to try those. Um, and by the way, I may have to cut my own hair, uh, not myself. I may have to get a haircut. Uh-oh. Because my the bottom third of my hair is so aged and weathered and fucked. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know it, it's just a kind of a mess. But I may be forced to get a new hairstyle. So I'm hoping you will still love me without my long pink locks. I will. You loved me before. So I did. I'm sure you will, so, but uh, I will. just a fair warning that I may have a dramatic change in appearance somewhere in the next couple of months. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Luckily, I sit down when we record, so I'll be prepared. I won't fall over. <laughs> Let's take a break. We'll take a break and then we'll be right back with our classroom segment, which is Barbara's conversation on allergy thresholds, the missing link. Show Season has a great enzymatic cleaner called Kennel Fresh. And you dilute it with warm water and it smells good. And then it evaporates to be a deodorant. As the kettle fresh dries, it's enzymatic. It eats the bacteria and the odor source. So it's really good stuff. You can use it indoors or out. Find it at your local distributors or showseasongrooming.com. We want to welcome Randy and Cheryl Lowe from Precision Sharp and invite you to check out their website where you can see their newest precise cut shear called Lynx. It's a patented design featuring a thumb ring that slides the length of the handle for perfect ergonomic placement of your thumb. Slide it and lock it into position to get your best groom on. Check it out at precisionsharp.com. Groomers, take your seats. It's time for Bee Bird's Classroom. All right, Barbara. I myself suffer from all kinds of environmental allergies and started testing when I was five and went through seven years of shots and stuff like that. 
allergies are a big part of my life. So tell me what you've learned. I've learned a lot about uh, contact allergies. So, you know, there's food allergies, there's environmental allergies, and there's contact allergies, which is contact with your skin. And that's what we're mostly interested in, in uh, exploring contact allergy potential of our grooming products. And one thing I want to I want to emphasize is that it's not just the pets that can develop allergies by use of these, but way more at risk are the bathers because allergies develop in relation to the number of exposures, the length of the exposure, you know, and the concentration of the allergen. That's the three. Okay, we got it. So those are the those are factors that I've learned before. And of course, the individual's own immune system, because everybody's different. And limonene is definitely one of the most uh, common sensitizers in fragrances and in cosmetics um, in general. But um, among the fragrance allergens, limonene is a, the the prince or one of the most common. It's the biggest offender. Yeah, it's the biggest offender. But what I learned about this week, I love reviewing. So for me, reviewing means look at it again, read it again, research it again. I love to review and I pride myself that with every week I'm reviewing something that I've looked at before or written about before, but I want to see if it still holds true or if there's something more to learn. So I've spoken briefly in the past about there being such a thing as allergy threshold. And I want to dig a little deeper into that because allergy threshold is beginning in the scientific community to have a larger importance than we even recognized before. So the allergy threshold is the maximum amount of an allergic substance that can be tolerated uh, by an individual without producing an adverse reaction. The maximum amount that's okay. So when you supersede that amount, you get an allergic reaction of various kinds. It can be a skin rash, it can be blisters, it can be a hot spot, it can be immediate, or it can be delayed response, allergy symptom, but there's a th always a threshold uh, in place. So the allergy threshold can have to do with how many times you're exposed to the allergen. So that builds up and then the threshold is reached. Here's what happens. Your body doesn't know about the substance. You introduce this substance to the skin and your immune says, what's this shit? This ain't right. It identifies that substance as an enemy, as a bad thing. And it creates, it produces a certain kind of antibodies called IgE, which trigger an inflammatory reaction. And it's responsible for various symptoms of the allergy. But it doesn't necessarily trigger it that first time. It's not going to trigger it that first time. It's just going to summon the soldiers. <laughs> Get them ready to go to war. It summons the soldiers. So you get to, you know, like five or six of them lining and up, boom. Well, then the next time that it can that expose the individual to that substance, those soldiers say, oh, wow, this is a bad thing. And then the body creates some more IgE, more soldiers come to the front line and they're ready. They might be planning an attack. They might make an attack. It might be over the person's threshold the second time that the person is exposed, or it might take a hundred freaking times. The takeaway from that is that allergic reactions can happen over time and it's with the same product. So the old excuse of, well, I've been bathing them for five years with that shampoo, that doesn't float. 
because that's exactly what happens with an allergy. Sometimes it's the second, some people, their immune system is so hysterical and on edge and like a little paranoid immune system. You, we've all known people like that. And certainly it sounds like you had some of that happening in your youth where your, where your immune system was just identifying lots of shit as the enemy. You know, oh, I'm allergic to this. Oh, I'm allergic to that. Oh, this is no good. This is a stranger. <laughs> stranger danger, stranger danger. Stranger danger, stranger danger. And it just depends. People have a different allergy threshold. Now, what I learned this time at reviewing this uh, business is that it has become apparent that it's more likely that several different allergens, whether they're in our food, from the environment, or in our skin products, they each contribute to getting you closer to the threshold or the point of attack. We used to think that it was just one thing at a time, that you had to have enough limonene in there, limonene exposure to meet your threshold. But we now know that there could be linalool in there, there could be other chemical components that are allergens all mixed up in the bucket and they together surpass the allergy threshold and you have an allergic reaction. So there's, they synergize, so to speak, or they, you know, it's a collective kind of a thing. You don't just need a whole lot of one thing. You could have a, a moderate or even a little amount of a lot of things, a lot of allergens, or a group of five things in one product that took you over the line. That's kind of revolutionary. We never thought about that before. We just thought, it was solo activity, but it's not. That blew my mind. I know. Does it do anything to yours? I mean, I sometimes I think I'm all alone out here. In the... I have to admit that the allergy threshold theory was taught to me by my allergist the last time I went through the shots. And he explained it pretty much like this. He said, you have a cup. And you fill it up with allergens. It doesn't have to be, like you said, the same allergen. But when the cup gets full, it overflows and you have a reaction. That's how he put it, but I like yours better. <laughs> well, and the, the thing that I extracted mine from was a, an analogy to having a bucket. That's the same thing. Yes. A larger amount. That, I mean, and some people can take a cup and some people can take a bucket before it overflows and causes a problem, right? Yep. And the older you get, because you've been around for so long and exposed to your things so much, you tend to be more likely to have an allergic reaction. So I couldn't understand, like five or six years ago, I became really aware that I had a terrific dust allergy. Oh, I would be horribly sick if I had that. <laughs> <laughs> but here's the deal. I was allergic to dust, but only when it was in the air. It was like sitting <laughs> on a bookshelf. I was fine. But as soon as I tried <laughs> to clean the bookshelf, <laughs> I was in trouble. <laughs> I was sneezing. I had a headache. I ugh. My eyes were watering. Finally, I realized I was allergic to dust and it had accumulated all time and my cup spilleth over. <laughs> In the next few weeks, we're going to explore some of the components of cosmetics that are known allergens. And I'm going to kind of try to fact check some of that. And uh, I'll bring that to you on a, a, a kind of a slice of the pie basis because I don't want to overwhelm you. Although I'm really thinking that there's a seminar in this whole uh, allergic contact dermatitis of pets. Um, and I, what I want to emphasize again is that more at risk than the pets are our bathers, are people who have their hands in contact 
with these cosmetics over and over again, multiple times a day, five or more days a week, week after week after week. So there's just so many more exposures and allergic response is really related to the number of exposures. So you might not even know that you're a susceptible person until you have an outbreak. And then what do you do? Then you blame the last shampoo that you use. That makes sense. But it could have been, <laughs> that was just the trigger. The straw that broke the camel's back. The trigger is the drop that overflowed the cup. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> and then you tell everybody that well, this is a bad shampoo because you're just waiting to break out and that tipped your cup. So I want us to think about that. And here's another thought, Susie. This is another reason to use a recirculating bathing system. Definitely. Yeah, it's just, there, here's another reason to use a recirculating bathing system because you are reducing your contact with the cosmetics that you're applying to the dog. You're not immersing your hands in it. You're not immersing your hands in it for a long period of time because shampoo lathering and massaging and then rinsing and rinsing and then checking for rinsing and all of that is a, a prolonged contact and much more concentrated than what you get with the bathing system. Although the bathing system, it washes the product over and over again, you often don't have to have contact. I mean, you kind of want to at first, because at first we take such good pride in ourselves for being thorough bathers that we want to get in there with the bathing beauty or the whatever we're using and get our hands all wet. But it's not necessary to do a lot of that. A lot of that is just for our own pleasure and uh, our own ego that makes us think that we have to... Uh, work the hair more. So not only do we do more damage to the hair, the more we rub it and smush it around, but we do more damage to our potential to have a reaction to shampoo by the in increased contact and length of contact to the cosmetics. So how's that? Excellent. I've learned a lot. Well, I'm glad. I love the study of allergies because it has so affected my life. I learned a lot in, in reviewing. We'll continue with this. Yes, good. And next week we'll have Chris and Ashley Hanby on with us. So look forward to that when we're talking about the new and exciting stuff coming out of Hanby Engineering. And, of course, Barbara and I will be here like we are every single week. Anyway, happy grooming, everybody. Bye-bye now. And remember, we love you.